Hello, everyone, and welcome to Seriously Loco, the Seriously Crazy Fan Podcast for El Paso Locomotive FC, proud member of the Beautiful Game Network, and brought to you by Roughneck Scarves and Icarus FC. I'm your host, Phil Baki. Tonight, uh, I'm joined by the normal crew. We got uh, we got the crew out tonight. Christian Canales is first and foremost. What's up, Christian? What's up? Uh, it's good to be here. Nine in a row or eight in a row. What are we at now? Eight, eight on, in a row. Eight on beat. Eight in a row. Five wins. It's a, a good, good time, time to be a Loco fan. Exactly. <laughs> and we're also joined by Mika Brell tonight. Mika, what's going on? What's up, gentlemen? Nothing much. Um, another day, another dub for Los Locos. I know. <laughs> it's all. It's it's. It's always tough when you go on these runs because you're like, it's inevitably going to end and it's going to be very sad. But <laughs> for now, we enjoy. It doesn't have to. I mean, it we're could. not that far away from the postseason. <laughs> true, true, true. It could end in, in the championship on, <laughs> yeah. on ESPN. Uh, actual yeah. ESPN, which we found out the uh, the title game will be on the 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 mother the mother station i guess the uh the actual <laughs> flagship of ESPN which is pretty cool news um for anyone with title aspirations uh in this in this return to play but um Austin Young is also going to be joining us in a little bit but um he might be just a bit late to the party but he'll be hopping on here in a second um Christian what's what's on your mind today i've got a i've got a marital dilemma guys and a marital dilemma. Oh my god! I'm a. Uh, this question is open to everyone, though. Phil might have the best insight, being that he's the the only other married member of this podcast at the moment. But so, as you all might have seen on Twitter, the locomotive yellow keeper jerseys were on sale yesterday. They had kind of a flash sale for them. They were. Yeah. My wife has wanted one all year. She had some time yesterday, so she took the opportunity to go down and buy it. She's very excited about it. We're going to the game on Saturday. We'll be in the stands, my, my wife and I and my parents. She wants to wear her yellow jersey as we play against New Mexico United. I have to tell her no. She's protesting. She wanted to put it to a podcast vote on if she should be allowed to wear her new yellow jersey. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Mika, I, I'm tossing this to you first. I don't, what? I don't, I don't know. I don't. This was supposed to be for the married person to answer first. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think this has anything to do with marriage, quite honestly. This, this has to do uh, with... This has to do with... A representation and a stalwartness, but I I want to I want to know what what is going through your mind right now. Okay, so ooh, I mean I'm always inclined to say happy wife, happy life, <laughs> and she did just get the oh man, but it does oh shit. <laughs> the thing is it's so blatantly yellow like yeah i like guess solid no yellow yeah can the, she like <sighs> accent it with like a blue scarf or something like so she was like okay well i'll wear my my locomotive scarf that it like the 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 inaugural season one which is like dark blue and yellow and i was like well dark blue does look an awful lot like black <laughs> oh, sh- yeah that's true <laughs> so mm. oh man this is a tough one i'm like i'm struggling <laughs> with this Mar- marriage is a scam listeners <laughs> don't do it i mean straight up <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm inclined oh god that is this is a tough one uh like this would be easier if you guys had never met her before. I'm sure. Well, that's what I was gonna say. Like Martha <laughs> is like inviting me into her home. I'm not yeah. about to get canceled. Like best Super Bowl party ever. I don't want to shit all over that. I I'm yeah. just saying that. Like, okay. I, I guess- say letter 
if she can dress it up with some kind of blue. Like, it cannot just be solid yellow out here in these streets. <laughs> um, yeah, because this is Darby. Like, she can't. Yeah, we don't want to get twisted. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's tough. The only, the only leg you have to stand on, maybe... Because she is excited about it. She went out of her own volition and bought locomotive gear, which is like, that's a W. That is pretty dope. That's that's a W <laughs> right there. So I don't want to, like, discourage that. But the only leg you may have to stand on is that Logan will certainly be wearing the red kit in this match. There's no way he's wearing yellow against a team who, who's col- primary color is mainly, you know, yellow so i mean that's the only angle i think that you you could get out of this but i don't know it's tough See, but then she's gonna be like okay go buy me the red kit then. Ooh. <laughs> maybe that's the end goal power move i guess and, you, and she finessed you <laughs> yes you might be right um, she acts like she doesn't know what's going on too much with locomotive soccer, but she knew. <laughs> she knew so, the picture this weekend. So it's so <laughs> so. Are we officially voting? I Let's say yes it. with scarf, blue scarf. I mean, I already That's said it. mine's a no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so am I a tiebreaker right now? Is that what's happening? Maybe yeah. we'll we'll give Austin, Austin a vote Austin. when he comes back. <sighs> And married listeners, let us know when this post what you think. Maybe it'll maybe it'll co- come out in time for you to give us your thoughts. We should put it. We should make a Twitter poll. We'll Let's make do a Twitter that. Poll. I like. Yeah, it. is it okay to wear yellow in the Derby del Camino Real? Oof. Because yellow is a one of our colors too. Like it is. The fuck. It is. Maybe that's. Maybe we're like take back. You know, like take back the power in this situation. <laughs> Like wearing yellow is actually a don- <laughs> that's actually a power move. Oh, true. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Guys, seriously, local listeners, show up to the game on Saturday in, in yellow. yellow. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I think that only works if there's a full. Yeah, there only works if there was like a full stadium. Yeah, there's too few to yeah. for it to be a power move. Oh man. Okay. Um, yeah, Christian, I I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to I'm going to go with the yes with that, you know, disclaimer that there's got to be a loco scarf or something like in involved because you can uh you can't just go pure yellow where, you know, from the wide angle it may look as if there's one more united fan than there actually is, which uh, you know, I can't abide that. So so I will grant it, but it's only because of her enthusiasm for <laughs> the kit and going out and buying it herself. Shout out to Martha for for making it happen on the flash sale. I got to I have to give credit where it's due. Tough but fair. Yeah. Right. I I I hated to do that because your heart's in the right place. I 100% in you know, in theory, <laughs> I agree with you. In application, tougher to to stick to my guns, I think. Um, God, that was a good one, Chrissy. You hit us with a. I was. I was surprised. <laughs> um, before we get to Locomotive's win over Rail Monarchs and and to our talk about the Derby um, later in the episode, uh, we had Loco alumni uh, playing. You know, uh, abroad. We'll say, um, <laughs> Jerome Jerome Kiesevetter, You know, signed for Inter Miami in the summer chances to play have been few and far between for the orthodontist and last night his venture in MLS hit a new low unfortunately and he was on the bench for Fort Lauderdale um my Inter Miami's USL League 1 affiliate club um he was on the bench to start the game last night for them. Keys, like, he just deserves better than this at the end of the day, right? Like, Mika, you you nicknamed him after all. Like, <laughs> what, how has this got you feeling? Oh, my God. I'm all types of mad when I saw <laughs> this. Um, 
I think realistically, we all thought he probably would be squad depth for Inter Miami at best. But to see him in League One, I mean, he's clearly above that level, for, you know, just based on what he did for us. Uh, but, you know, when you sign a certain Gonzalo Higuain, definitely you're, you're sliding down the depth chart at that attacking, at that number nine position. Um, so it's really unfortunate for him. He's only made, you know, two substitute appearances, just 56 minutes in, in League One. So it's like they're not even using him as much as a player of his caliber should be used in League One. So um, I, I don't – obviously it has not gone to plan for him at, at Inter-Miami. And um, I'm going to need Mark Lowry to put in a cheeky loan offer <laughs> so we can have – the orthodontist out here for the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> I think, unfortunately, this season the rosters in USL are are locked now. They're locked already. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, I think yeah. that that arbitrary date has passed um, for <laughs> locking rosters. Um, but Christian, I mean, it, it is tough to see because at the end of the day, like the question mark is just like, why were they in for him in the first place? If if it's gone this you know off the rails i guess yeah i mean like you said i think we knew when he moved that you know he wasn't going over there to be to be a starter um and it's it's just strange because like he's not young you know i I don't think they're sending him down to to fort lauderdale to develop him no you know um he's 27 yeah, he's. I think he's. He's as good as he's gonna be. You know, yeah. um, and this is. I would. I correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like these kind of like 27 to 30 are probably your your golden years as a as a striker. So, mm-hmm. yeah. um, it's it's rough. I, I don't understand. Yeah, I it it really does pain me to see just because obviously, as you said, Mika, like we know what he can do. We know what he's capable of at a championship level, Um, you know, and as we said, I never expected him to replicate that form or that level of play in MLS because it it is a step up and it's it it's not necessarily easy to hold a place when Inter Miami are throwing money at at Iguain, but like you just hope that he's given a shot, I guess. And for half a season, you know, really like they haven't even played, you know, anything comparable to a whole season. And he's already like kind of fallen out of favor. Um, So I just hope that there's room for a return. I think it would be awesome to, to see him back because Obviously, at his best, he was scoring for fun for us. Um, and as soon as Inter Miami was interested, combined with his injuries, he kind of like fell off um, towards the end of last season. So I think maybe you know in the future he's had he's had that taste of of MLS. Say it didn't really work out. Like go back to where you were thriving, and like find your level and just, and just thrive there. That's kind of my, kind of my thoughts for Jerome, but who knows if a move is in the cards or if he maybe tries to go back abroad, who knows? It could be really could, could be anything at this point. Yeah. I guess, I I guess I wouldn't be surprised if he maybe does try to find a a club in Germany. He's still represented by a, a German sports agency. So maybe they've got contacts there, but yeah, it's a shame. It yeah. really is. It, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And hopefully Jerome does find a club where he can play and be, be happy. But, um, but for locomotive, the current squad, uh, all all's good, uh, at the moment, as we talked about eight unbeaten and a fifth win in the row in a row, this time a one nil win, over monarchs um and the interesting thing about this one is we we had talked in the previous episode about how we expected changes we expected rotation um in the lineup but we really wanted to keep the pressure on new mexico united now that we've taken top spot in the group and uh christian i mean 
the lineup did change pretty significantly. Couple couple of big pieces, uh, you know, moving out and and other people moving in, um, but the same result. So locomotive actually showing a good deal of depth these days. Yeah, it, it was impressive. Um, you know, to have Memo and Drew and Said and Disto all on the field at the same time. You know right out of the gate is something that I don't, I don't think that was a lineup we would have predicted, you know, in a hundred chances at the beginning of the season and um, for them to do it and to put on a good performance, you know, that we knew that this wasn't probably wasn't going to be a lineup that's going to score, you know, three, four goals. Um, but defense did a really good job. I, I think we had a clean sheet and it wasn't all because of Logan this time. Um, I think I think the defense played really well, which is surprising because this is a, a you know a back four that I think have seen zero minutes together this season. Right. Um, so so it's it's impressive. Yeah, I think Mika that that was kind of what struck me about this is that it it wasn't the flashiest performance, but Mark has now in this in this un, in this unbeaten run used. 20 different starters um, in the eight matches. That's not something that we were capable of last season in terms of the, the squad depth being able to rely on such a large portion of, of the squad. Yeah, not, not at all last season. I think, I think this, this uh, level of rotation shows you how well drilled everyone is now in the system that we were able to kind of plug and play. Um, especially now that we've clinched, I think that becomes even more important. Um, you know, I have to say when I first saw the lineup come out, I was a little skeptical. So, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of, I, I still don't know really what to make of Memo Diaz. Um, Drew Becky can be, you know, on his day, good player, very, you know, athletic, but maybe defensively frail sometimes. Um, you know, not the, not the most creative midfield we could have put out there, but of course guys were needing to, to rest. And then, you know, we do have Salvador and Gomez leading the line. So, um, that gave us a little bit of continuity, but I mean, fair play to the guys. They played really well and, um, clean sheet, you know, we've, we've failed to, to earn clean sheets with our a team, I guess you could say out on the pitch. So yeah, big ups to them. And, um, yeah, they really, they, I think even though it wasn't a flashy performance, they, they certainly dominated if you, if you look at the stats. So, yeah, that, and I think that's something that we haven't had the chance to talk about much, um, this season, uh, because so many of the performances have relied on an attacker or someone like having that moment of magic and, and kind of, um, finding a way to, to win, you know, after maybe conceding a goal or two. Um, and in this case, it, it felt like a, a kind of complete performance in the sense that Monarchs only threatened like once that I can remember the save of the match was not technically a save. Um, you know, the GECU save of the match or whatever was just Logan <laughs> catching a cross. Um, so in terms of control and the ability to just keep monarchs from, you know, at a distance and never really, you know, using the boxing analogy, like monarchs never really laid a glove on us. Like the whole game, they didn't, they didn't land anything, um, no notable. Um, and so we didn't really, we weren't at our best attacking, but we didn't really need to be, um, in a lot of ways because of the rest of the way the rest of the team played. But the beginning of this game, there are a few missed chances and Christian, I mean, I know he's your boy, but Josue Ron Gomez, three shots off target this game. Do, are you concerned at all now that we've kind of, it's now, maybe in some cases like a drought. Yeah. I mean, I think that obviously, like we said before, you know, he's a striker and, you know, strikers are judged and judge themselves based on goals. But I think that it's different. <clears throat> I think that it's different from like maybe when Jerome last season went on his drought, because I think that that's, 
really all he can do. He does it fantastically, but a player like like Kisavetter, all he does is score goals. But Gomez, I think, is a more well-rounded player. And so he contributes so much in other areas that I'm not worried about him. I, when I when I get worried about players like that, I just feel like it's it's almost like why do we have them? Um, that's that's the the worry that's in my head is why are, why are these guys starting if if they're not able to do what they're there to do? And Gomez is doing all sorts of other things for us where I don't share that same concern. Would I like to see him, um, you know, have at least two or three more goals this season? Absolutely. But I think that he does so much more for us that, um, you know, he's fine. Mika, the, the chances at the beginning of the game, I, I think it's clear even based on Mark's like halftime comments, uh, (laughs) that are now a part of these broadcasts. Um, that he gets a little the only thing that really makes him mad it it seems because i think there's a lot of things that he can you know make kind of a positive spin on and and kind of like maintain positivity over but not scoring enough goals that's like what he's been harping on and just like being more ruthless do you think that's something that needs to improve going towards the postseason or are we just that team that like finds its moments and maybe we don't necessarily have like the four or five nil like in us yeah i i mean of course you always want to be a little more ruthless and but i I don't think it's as much of a problem this season as it was last season um what I find frustrating personally is that Omar's final ball seems to now be like good (laughs) and people are not getting on the end of it or making the most of it. So that's a little bit annoying to me because I always put it on Omar that, you know, you're the one not delivering a serviceable ball. Right. But now the past couple of games, he's shown us that, you know, a little bit more control on his crosses, better placement of his corner kicks and we're shanking these chances wide. So it's it's weird, man. I mean, I can't say that Gomez and, and Omar don't have chemistry because they play quite a bit together. But, um, I mean, I guess now that I, I've kind of come around full circle, I guess that is a, a problem of ruthlessness as opposed to lack of chance creation. But, I mean, I don't know. We've seen, we've seen Gomez get hot for the, for the postseason, so... In, in what Christian was saying, I'm not too worried about it either. He does lead the press. He does defend, does a whole lot of running for us. So I'm um, still offering other things. Yeah. And I, I'm, Oh, go for I it. Say, I, I'm, I'm concerned overall about the team scoring. Um, Cause I think I was just looking at it right now. I think of the, of the 16 playoff teams right now, teams that would be going into the playoffs. If, if the season were over today, we are, third from from the bottom um as far as goals scored Mm -hmm. um so i think that when it comes playoff time um you know if if we want to make a run we might get out of you know a first round game you know scoring a goal but i think that they really have to start coming on if we want to make it to the you know the quarterfinals semifinals and finals kind of thing so right i think that's an important thing to look at as much everyone else is scoring too even if we are you know i think we're, we still identify as a you know a defensive based team. I think that we're going to start getting tired too. Mm-hmm. Um, even though we are pretty deep, I think uh, you know it, it takes a lot for a defense to to be strong all year. And I don't think our defense is as good last year in terms of you know keeping a clean sheet. So we're we're a little more vulnerable, I would say. So I think that we really need to turn the scoring on the chance creation overall ends up being pretty decent in, in this match. And we end up having nine shots from inside the box, which is pretty good. Unfortunately, only one of those was on target and the other eight were off target, which obviously, especially with a guy like Ochoa playing, you would, you'd prefer to have a higher volume (laughs) on target. So the fact that he really only had one, uh, save to make and didn't um, is is uh, you know lucky for us I guess in this case and uh, we'll get to the goal um, in a little bit but first uh, 
Mika, kind of a worst nightmare situation for you occurs in the 19th minute. Uh, Andrew Fox inadvertently run into um, by Drew Becky and comes off injured. Um, the the Fox injury at the time it had us has pretty concerned. I feel. I feel. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't this the second week in a row where Fox kind of like clatters into someone? I just feel like there's a lack of communication back there in that same <laughs> area of the of the box nearest yeah. eighth notch. Um, you know, I've got my opinions about Drew Becky as a player. I do think this is probably an accident, but if <laughs> if you know he caused him an injury, that's just not great. Um, Foxy is 100 our starting left back. Um, someone very crucial to our buildup as we tend to, you know, break out down the left. Um, and uh, we need him for the postseason. So, yeah, this is it's not great. It happens, you know, f- just a couple feet from where Christian and I were sitting. And I think it was probably pretty hard to hide my anxiety about the situation. <laughs> um <sighs> It's just, it's annoying. Yeah. Like they just need to be communicating better back there. I think last, last week it was, I think it was when uh, Foxy gave away the penalty. That was another yeah. mix up with him and, and Brent Coleman, if I'm not mistaken, yep. kind of clattering into each other. And then him kind of, you know, uh, wrapping his arms around the uh, attacker. And then this week it's just clattering into each other for, I don't know what reason. So, <laughs> um, I hope Foxy's all right. Um, obviously, we have no freaking clue um, right. <laughs> because uh, they just don't tell us that those kind of things. But uh, yeah, it's he was it's in training. He was in training pictures, though. He was kind of okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that is good because hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we'll. Uh, yeah, hopefully we won't have any issues um, with Foxy being available. Uh, this weekend, um, but that's uh, a story for another time. I mean, in this case, Christian, we do have Ador Borelli now who can come on, and that's a pretty big game changer in terms of like having a sub who we know is of like at least comparable quality to Fox. If not, I mean, at full strength, he may be like, I don't know, we don't really know the full extent of his powers within this team. Um, but having a guy like Borelli to come off the bench is just absolutely massive. Oh yeah. I mean, like we, I don't think, like you said, I don't think there's a, if there's any, I don't think there's a dip in quality. Um, the only concern is, you know, these are his, I don't like 61st minutes, you know, he got, he started the game before got subbed out. And so it's, it's still, um, you know, he's still new to, to the game day squad. So that's a little bit concerning, but as far as quality, you know, it, it's not, um, you know, he's not unknown to us. So it's, it's impressive. Like we've said, you know, multiple weeks in a row now, the, the depth and, uh, options that we have on this team. Austin, um, now that you've, uh, you've joined in, uh, we were the only one like Mika and Christian were watching in the stadium, but you and I were watching on ESPN plus and at the water at the first hydration break, uh, we got a, a little bit of a treat, the unexpected treat of Nick Ross joining the commentary team of Duke Keith and Michael Balligan, uh, on ESPN plus like one of the performances of the night on the field or off Nick Ross in commentary. I mean, that was was the performance of the night (laughs) man of the match. Nick Ross in the commentary booth. What'd you think? What'd you think of Nick in in that spot? So first off, I'm no longer calling it the hydration break. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. It's officially the Abuelita's hot chocolate break. <laughs> Shout out Jay from Eighth Notch Central Texas, though. He gave me the uh, the inspiration on that night that it was really cold. So that's how it's officially going to be dubbed now. But no, he did amazing. He brought in like an insight that we haven't really seen. And again, no disrespect to the broadcasting booth at all. But <clears throat> just Nick um, bringing in, you know, just his his mentality as a player, and then 
I mean, just his voice too is just soothing. Like, <laughs> I, can I just have his voice on loop as I fall asleep? <laughs> yeah, he, cross ASMR. <laughs> yeah, he. I think what was so good about it is that I think it would be very easy for a player to be kind of like to overthink that appearance, if you will, and be like in his head about, am I being like insightful? Am I being like interesting? Am I whatever? But he was very casual in his approach. Like he felt natural um, in his commentary and like in his insight. And then he was legit funny, which is crazy to me because I was laughing during a locomotive game, like at commentary moments and not like, not in a like, you know, hashtag USL things. Um, <laughs> not laughing way. at them. Laughing right. With them. <laughs> like he, he told a joke and I wish I had prepared the clip cause it was so good. Um, but they made the joke about, um, about a, a Monarchs player who came on uh, late in the game. I have to remember his name. Um, Bodie something. Yeah, Bodie, Bodie Davis, um, who w- he just turned 20, so he's born in the year 2000. And Nick Ross comments on the fact that he's, like, born in the year 2000. Like, he's, ma- he's made me feel real old there. He could be Richie Ryan's son. <laughs> and I died. I thought that was the funniest thing. So guys, I mean, the Nick Ross, the commentator, I mean, does he have a post playing uh career like job like lined up already? Well, sir, better get that in his contract right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the biggest leagues have three man booths, so why not? <laughs> this made me think about the fact that, you know, in a few years, by the time like Nick is ready to retire, having a guy in the booth who was around for like the first era of locomotive that like an actual former locomotive player, that would be pretty amazing like it it, be sick. it feels like it's an a layer of history that we have to kind of like get to um obviously but uh but yeah nick showed a level of professionalism there in the booth that i think i think he's got you know i, I think he's got something going there like i think he could do that we got to get Nick on the show. We keep talking about it. I know. We got to get that ASMR voice on here as well. I know. I hit him up and he liked it. So, like, <laughs> I can't ever tell if likes on Twitter are endorsements or just. Nick, uh, we need Nick. We need a yes or a no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe they say I. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the. So. After Nick joined, though, um, it was almost as if he spurred the team on uh, via via his voice because um, <laughs> Christian, just before halftime, a um, little bit of a broken attack um, by Locomotive. Ball comes back out, out to Memo. And Adair had, like, moved into a somewhat, like, offensive area just outside the box and he's he he was making a run um but as memo received the ball i actually said to no one out loud in here like continue that run to for adair to continue to keep running because there was clearly like an overload on that side memo plays an inch perfect ball to the back post Adair heads in the bravo a Bravos boy connecting with, with the local boy fullback to fullback. This is the type of goal that Mark Lowry has dreamed about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a great goal. You know, the, the ball looks great. You know, as we were celebrating the header and the goal and, you know, I, I just wanted to, to bring attention to the, to the past. But after I looked at it again, I Memo will probably deny this, you know, but I'm pretty sure that ball was going for Gomez. Um, I think that that's who the ball was for. I think he (laughs) overhit it. And luckily, not that it matters because a goal is a goal, but I think uh, Borelli was in the right place at the right time because I I just don't believe that that he saw 
at air making that run. Um, and if he did, you know, it's fantastic vision, but I don't buy it, honestly. <laughs> Savage. Just like not give it. I mean, Austin, from Adair's perspective, that header is, it looks simple on TV, but controlling that and guiding it to the far, to the far post, that's a pretty tough technique. And Edder pulls it off, makes it look easy. No, definitely. That's, that's like top class right there. Like, <clears throat> think about all the crosses we get in all the time. You think these guys are just going to hit it right over the bar, but that was top, cl- top class right there. And I mean, I was thinking about it too. Who would have thought that the first guy that came from Bravos this season, the score goal would have been Edder? <laughs> I think we all thought it would have been Carijo. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Honest. Yeah. I mean, and it was it was a case of right place, right time. Certainly, Christian. I think uh, I think Edder kind of gambles um, that there might be a ball on at the back post. I don't know. I don't know that he even expects the cross to come all the way through to him. Um, but it certainly it certainly does in the end. And I mean, Mika, we talked about the importance of fullbacks in Mark Lowry's system. We've talked about how it's. Um, you know, he models so much of what he does around what Liverpool have done, what city have done over, over the past couple of seasons with Klopp and Guardiola. Um, this goal feels like it, especially Kloppian in its design. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Fullback to fullback, as you said. Um, I don't know. I thought that he was looking for, for Edder making that run. So I'm going to have to disagree a little bit with Christian there, but <laughs> um, one w- the thing that I wondered, and this is just, for me, criminal defending by Real Monarchs, is why is Memo in acres of space? Yeah, I mean, it, it tells me they thought he wasn't a threat there, which, you know, fair enough, because he's pretty far out. But I, one thing I have noticed about Memo, and I, I commented on it in the warm-up to Christian, is when he's just – on the ball by himself, no one pressuring him. He could pick out a cross yeah. very well. Um, you know, obviously, if you're playing against a team that's going to be pressing really hard, then then his skill set's probably pretty nullified. I don't know that he could do that in in tight spaces or or with less time on the ball. But I mean, he's got forever right. to pick something out or at least put it in an area where someone could get to it, um, which you know ended up happening. So. Not great, not great defending, not great uh, recognition uh, or recognizing of space, right? Um, by by monarchs and uh, yeah, um, not that we got lucky, but it's just not good from them there. Yeah, and the thing I love about that goal is that it it comes partially from the fact that Memo is is in a bit of space, and I think I think it's a little bit of luck because of the way that the ball does come back out. Um, and we're able to work it back to memo and, and kind of create that separation. But the run, the run from Ed air of, you know, really is what makes it obviously because he gets on the end of the cross, but that additional runner, um, Monarchs completely lose him. There, there is no tracking of Edder as he comes into the box. There's no one because Gomez has a guy in front of him, which I think the cross evades him, you know, fairly easily. So no issues there, but it just, it, no one was aware of, of Edder making that run aside from him basically. <laughs> and, uh, right. and so, uh, and then, you know, just to, as I, as I said, you know, in talking to Austin, just the, the control on the header at a sprint on a ball that's lofted like that is really not easy. Like, um, and he does such a, such a great job just guiding it back to, to the far post and, and really giving Ochoa no shot at it, which, um, yeah. And then obviously rightly celebrating down there in the corner, um, that we can't see, uh, on TV. So (laughs) (laughs) no, it was, uh, it was a great goal and it was, it, like we said, tougher finish than it looks. Um, but uh, so locomotive take a one nil lead. A lot of the second half is spent toiling. I would say um, it's not much, but it's honest work. Like that's that I felt that, you know, <laughs> I felt yes. that meme uh, to its core, but there was a funny moment um, in commentary. And then, you know, just in the match where Nick, Ross is talking about the fact that he would love to see Richie get a goal. 
it's like his it's like his thing that he wants to see like you know before Richie's career is over type thing um and only a few minutes after this happens there is actually a pretty big chance uh that falls straight to Richie after Ochoa has kind of a failed clearance where he goes to try to swat the ball away because it was like deflected towards him. He swats it straight down into the path of Richie. His shot is blocked by a Monarchs player and then a goal kick is given and Richie loses his goddamn mind. Um, So the powers of Nick Ross and commentary, not only are, you know, insightful and all and, and interesting, but he nearly speaks a Richie goal into existence. Like, is he controlling things secretly? Like, is he able to, to conjure up moments <laughs> just by saying them? No, but in this case, kind of a weird moment. Richie almost gets a goal. Is this the, is this the chance where Ochoa inexplicably punches straight into his box when he should have just tipped it over? Is that yeah. what we're talking about? Yeah. yeah the, I mean, that, I call it the Pickford as a Liverpool fan. That is exactly (laughs) what that is. It was, that was just really insane decision-making in the worst way. I just, if, if Logan ever did something like that, I'd be pulling my hair out. Um, And, and he's, he gets mitts on it. So why don't you just guide it out? I I don't know. So um, if, if, if Ochoa doesn't make that ridiculous decision there, then Richie didn't even have that fall to him, but I mean, good on the defender, I guess to, to, to block it. They, you know, we, you're exactly right. It was very much honest work. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a lot of toiling, a lot of grafting, but Real Monarchs had to make 28 clearances in this game to R5. So um, I think if we were working hard, they were working even harder. And that was just one of those, one of those instances where they're just trying to hoof it out and, 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 you know, get a little bit of a break from the pressure, but yeah, it All would right. be nice if, if Richie scores and and that's, you know, his last goal of his career is with locomotive. Not that we're trying to retire him early or anything, but, um, (laughs) but yeah, no, that would be, that would be really sweet. The, the pressure is something we've talked about recently, Christian, just of like, we build and build and we eventually just break teams down. This was a match in which it didn't really, it didn't, well, it didn't amount to anything in the end in terms of goals, but in terms of control, we're able to walk away from the match without really conceding anything at the other end. So the system is working kind of in the way that it's designed, I guess. Right. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's interesting, you know, when we talk about the pressure and, and it leading to anything, I, I'm, I couldn't get a feel during the game, you know, once we got later on into the game, if if Mark was satisfied with the 1-0 or, like, if he was trying to go for more, I think the fact that I think Dylan and Richie came on at the same time, mm-hmm. and that really confused me. You know, that's one of those <laughs> things where, where you have Dylan who's coming on who sends the signals that, like, oh, like, we're trying to score, and also you have Richie coming on, which tells me, oh, mate, maybe we're just going to kind of hold on to the ball. Yeah. So I, I didn't know what to think. Um but I, I guess yeah, I mean it worked. We got the win, and and it it wasn't um, it wasn't an ugly win. Um, it wasn't a a particularly attractive win either. But you know the three points when we need them on a day where you know with the New Mexico result that same day we we they may have felt a little bit more pressure to win. They they got they got it done. The Mentioning those substitutions, it reminded me, Austin, in the group chat during the game, I think I dropped a message in that said, Saeed and Distel have quietly had very good games. And not a minute later, not even a full minute later, they both were coming off. And uh, I think I think Mika and Christian were like, hey, I was I was wondering if you predicted the substitutions. Uh, but Austin, I mean, those two players did have good games, but can you see, like, I guess why Mark made that particular change in this one, just to maybe shore things up in midfield, but also add a guy like Dylan for a little bit more dynamics up top. 
Yeah, I mean, I thought that was funny too. Like you called it, and then like I kid you not, it was probably like instantly when that sub was made. <laughs> Because I think Mika said it's my stream lag. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm like, my stream can't be lagging because I'm literally here. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) No, yeah, you had me hella confused for a second there. I was. Are you in the Matrix? I was also confused. Um, The uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. um, No, really quick. I was going to say. I I think I was on the same boat as Christian. Not sure exactly what Mark was going to do, but. I thought Saeed was having a hell of a game, like something we really hadn't seen from him like all year. Um, Distel was just being Distel out there doing Distel things, <laughs> but this is <laughs> ground tackles the way he does. But yeah. yeah, I don't know if Mark was going for another one or playing, was wanting to hold back, but at the same time, Mars, yes, is like a pivotal part of our attack, but he can do so much as well as in just controlling the ball. Right. So the sub kind of makes sense as well, but I'm still kind of confused about that sub, to be honest. Like to bring those two guys in at the same time. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting, but like like we said, it it results in the right in the right result, and we do we do end up with the win. Uh, no one to credit more than than the defense, and I think in particular, I just want to shout out. We've talked about the midfield, we talked about the defense in terms of their contribution, but I do want to shout out. Meshack and Memo in their performances tonight, the right side of defense. Um, Christian, Meshack hasn't maybe had his most consistent or good season. In a lot of games, we've questioned, uh, and you know, in episodes, we've questioned kind of where he's at right now. This type of game is kind of like Meshack's like bread and butter in that he's not under a ton of pressure and he has like the, the space to create um, and play those long passes. We, we talk about the switch or whatever. And Meshack was loving the long pass tonight, 19 accurate long passes in this game. That's incredible. I, I didn't know that number, but that's incredible. And I think, I think that he's coming into form because this is probably, I think game three in a row, um, Honestly, I, I think it's since since Chira, um, maybe that that partnership just isn't ideal for him. But um, you know, we've seen three games where he's put in solid performances. You know, both with Brent and with Drew in this one. So maybe for whatever reason, that partnership just isn't what it what it was. You know, at the beginning of last year. But you know, he's he's come into form. He, I think we're seeing the player that we all expected him to be. Um, you know, at the beginning of this year, we're, we're seeing it now, which is a great time for that, for that to be happening. Absolutely. Um, guys, I got to ask the general question of the shit house 11. I mean, we know the player that we would love to put into the shit house 11 from monarchs and he played in this game, but did Ochoa do enough to earn himself a spot? Because I don't know that there's a shit house eleven worthy player in this team. Well, he was on the him, he like, was on the field, yeah. wasn't he? Like <laughs> what was that and him just rolling on the ground for like ten minutes. Oh yeah, he fucking did that shit again. Oh, yeah. no, I, forgot, I forgot about that. Yeah. This conversation is done. <laughs> like I forgot about that too, but yeah. Even the backup goalie started getting ready, and I think Phil made the comment, like, is this your first time here? He's going to roll around for a couple minutes. Like, <laughs> like he, This is just a thing that he does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. Phil, uh, did, did Ochoa do enough to get into the shithouse 11? And... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously he did, so... Uh, yeah, David Ochoa, <laughs> welcome to the Shit House Eleven. Uh, you've been a member of this side before. Um, you've you've We're gonna earned this place in so lifetime. <laughs> Mika, start writing up that lifetime contract. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> um, so now I want to get the game changers. Who was the player for you for Locomotive tonight, uh, Austin? We can start with you. Who who was that that man in blue that? Uh, that got the job done for Loco. So for me, and I think it comes down to one specific play because <clears throat> if he doesn't make that tackle, this game's probably going to finish one, one, and it's going to be Meshack. when he's got that two on one and he makes that open field tackle and just stops that complete attack. That's a good like, shout. 
just that one specific play for me is just, yeah, game changing. Like, because think about it, if he doesn't make that tackle, it's two on one against Logan, and we all know that's going to end in a goal, unfortunately. So, for me, that's the game changer right there. That's a really good shot. And I mean, on top of the rest of his performance, like Meshack is absolutely a candidate. And uh, yeah, I love, I love that suggestion. Mika, who's, who's the man for you? Yeah, actually I have to go with Meshack as well. I think that this was a, a classic Meshack performance that we were used to last season. Um, yeah. That, that defensive intervention that, that you talked about Austin was crucial. Um, and and really, he was the leader in defense, uh, you know, at the end of the night because Fox had to to go off injured and he got Memo on one side of him, you know, and Becky and Borelli on the other side. So really, there was a lot of responsibility on him to, to organize that defense and, and keep things solid at the back. On top of that, I mean, he won all his duels, made a couple of clearances for us. He even got fouled twice. So, um, you know, he was just... Uh, you know, all over the shop in terms of, of being, you know, very, very good for us. So yeah, I go with me check as well. Christian, what's your thought? I have a smart ass answer that leads into my legitimate answer, <laughs> but so my smart ass answer is uh, Drew Becky uh, because his actions certainly changed the game for us <laughs> in that, uh, <laughs> in that he takes Fox out of the game in the 19th minute. Oh no! However, his actions did lead to my legitimate answer, which would be Borelli, um, which might not be, you know, that might be a little bit of the obvious answer, but I think it, it holds water in the sense that, you know, to come on that early and to be the guy that literally makes the difference for your team. Um, I think that that shows, you know, some, some metal to be able to do that. So um, I'm, I'm going to go with Borelli for the sake of, of being different. That was, so that... he absolutely flattened somebody physical play of the match. <laughs> Pray. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I actually, that was, that was going to be, uh, my same suggestion, Christian, just that, uh, Borelli coming in. (laughs) (laughs) No, (laughs) although it did change, it did change the game. Um, no, and I, I mean, shout out to Drew because like he, he he has a fine game. Otherwise, like he's, (laughs) everything was, was good. Like he wasn't, he wasn't bad or anything. Um, but yeah, I think Borelli being able to come in um, that early, as you said, Christian is just, it, it's not, it's not easy to adapt to a game um, that quickly. Um, but he was straight in and didn't really, didn't really miss a beat. So I've got to agree with you there. Honorable mention, I think goes to to memo for the cross and it's just fullback union. Uh, as you said, Miko, with the handshake meme. So um the last bit of business before our first break, the score prediction update, Christian, how did we do this week? And is anybody making up ground on Austin? <laughs> did this I was it this week? No, you didn't Austin. Actually, you haven't, you're, you haven't even clinched from last place. So I'm still technically in it. Um, it's not going to happen, but <laughs> from a numbers perspective, <laughs> I'm still in it. Um, I'm not so- mathematically out. Yeah, just exactly. like the Mets are always in and until they're mathematically eliminated. <laughs> exactly. Um, but Phil was actually the, the most improved player this week. Um, he predicted a 1-0 win. Um, he had a Gomez goal, but that gives him three points for the week. Who is He is the highest scorer this week. Um, we all predicted wins of two. The rest of us predicted wins of 2-1. Um, none of us predicted a Borelli goal, um, you know, and who can blame us, um, without the, in- <laughs> without the, without the injury, it might not have happened. Right. But, um, so both Mika or all three Mika, Austin and myself all get one point for the two, one, um, just for picking a win. So that does bring Phil up considerably in the standings. Um, I'm stuck at nine with my one point, but Phil climbs up to 12 points, which puts him only one behind Mika at 13. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> 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 I 
And uh, Mika, so you have 13. You're still eight behind Austin. And with three games remaining, you're still in it with 12 points for, for anyone on the table. Uh, like I said, I'm 12 behind Austin. So I would need to have three perfect scores on Austin to, to lay three eggs to, to even <laughs> tie. This is not including the playoffs, of course. Um, right. you know, we'll continue this into the playoffs, but... Uh, we'll do so that's like where Austin, <laughs> knock you know, bonus out, points, knock bonus out. points for the playoffs. Oh no, knockout round. Uh, <laughs> 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 get it right or you're out. Um, no, Holy I. Uh, shit. <laughs> 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 tough. No. Um, well, I mean, the plot thickens in the in the score prediction league. So I don't know. A lot to play for still, um, as there is in locomotive season, and we have listener questions and the Darby discussion coming up after this break. You may have recently heard about seriously loco, uh, selling scarves and we got our scarves from our sponsor roughneck scarves. Uh, and thanks to them for the quality products they put out, uh, and for sponsoring the show. Um, they are the official scarf supplier to MLS, USL and U S soccer. And you can get custom scarves for your group or team at roughneckscarves.com. We love the scarves that they've made for us here at seriously loco. We hope you guys are enjoying them too, for those who bought them and, uh, check them out, uh, for any and all scarf needs. Um, be sure to use roughneckscarves.com. Welcome back to Seriously Loco. Uh, Now we're going to take some time and uh, answer some listener questions, go into the mailbag here. So uh, first up, um, we'll we'll go to uh, Cody James Bachmeyer, friend of the pod. um, And he asked, do you not think that we need to give our other keeper some game action just in case? And... Of course, he's referring to Jermaine Forda, a.k.a. Jermaine, um, who we I think we've all spoken to. Great guy. But what do you guys think? Um, does he see any... Do you see any reason for Logan to, to not play, basically, and to give, to give Jay some... Uh, maybe a shot at uh, getting some, some minutes? I think Honest? Cody himself doesn't think so because he called him <laughs> our other keeper. <laughs> I'm not trying to come for you, Cody, but I just like, no, I mean, ke- keepers fitness doesn't, um, as far as I know, doesn't fluctuate nearly as often as outfield players do. So I, I, I see no reason for, for Ketera to, to have a seat or, or be out of the squad. Um, Jermaine's, Jermaine's kind of like a glue guy, I think. Probably very good for the locker room. Obviously, very good for training. Um, but unless we were in a cup competition, you know, no reason to see him. Unfortunately, um, yeah. I think if Mark wanted to see him on the pitch, it would have been during that Colorado game last week when he made all the rotations. But mm. yeah, there's no reason to take Logan out if need be. Because I can tell you, being a keeper, it's all about repetition, getting those reps in as a keeper. So you take him out for one game, and it could really mess with the psyche. That's that's kind of the vibe that I that I get. Like I, I think there's a lot of benefit to rotating outfield players, like for fitness purposes, making sure that they're, um, you know, that they're able to to make it all the way through the season and not have these like maybe, you know, strain injuries or these, uh, um, injuries caused by, you know, stress on their, uh, on their bodies. But for the, for the keepers, I do think there is a, like a rhythm and a confidence, um, about how they, how they perform. And, um, I think keeping Logan as confident as possible, especially, especially this upcoming game, I think obviously, um, like even Cody knows that, that, against United he'll you know it'll be Logan barring you know something um you know some issue but uh but I think especially following up a clean sheet it's just good to try to capitalize on on that and and try to keep a a keeper in a good mindset um so no I think I think honestly the only the only shot that that um that Jermaine has is if uh 
is if we've, you know, clinched and for some reason we want to like maybe mothball Ketterer or whatever to make sure he makes it, you know, into the postseason. But I, I even then, I, I don't know that unless he maybe has like a rough game or something like that and needs kind of a mental reset. I don't, I don't really see the, that, uh, taking place. It's almost, I mean, Mika is kind of a hockey thing, but like taking a, a, a goalie out is more of a like, Hey, like kind of get, get your head in the, you know, kind of get your head right. And then like, we'll reintroduce you. Um, sure. definitely not like, a not something you do to someone who's feeling themselves. Yeah. I mean, I think the last, the last major club to really successfully rotate Hebrews was, was Barcelona when they had, uh, Claudio Bravo and, uh, Mark Andre Ter Stegen. One was clearly the, the league keeper and the other was in, you know, the cups and champions league, but you, even that's not so much a thing. Um, unless you, unless you're fighting on all f- four fronts, like a lot of English clubs are, but even then, this one, this this question's from Fernie uh, at LL Cool Fernie, um, which that at just needs some work. I'm sorry, it doesn't it doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> sorry, Fernie, I apologize, but it's just it's t- you know it's tough for me, and I know you don't care. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> he said uh, he asked, uh, let's say Locos win on Saturday and clinch first place, which is is a possibility. That's the situation that we're in. Um, he said, do you play the reserves the rest of the way or keep the starters going? Kind of in the same vein as the last question, but now including the rest of the team, do you kind of try to keep some rhythm with the starting 11 or do we you know, try to make sure that they're healthy for the postseason? Christian, I know, I know you've probably got some thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I think that um, I would hope that if, if we do clinch or, or when, you know, even if it's not this week, if it's next week or whatever, you know, that we do clinch, uh, um, first place that we do get a lot of different people rest. Um, you know, even, even more. So I hope we would see even more rotation than we did for Colorado, you know? And, and by that, I mean, you know, that we see Matt Boehner get some minutes. We see McKinney get some minutes. Um, I think everyone in the midfield has gone in and out at some point. Sure. Um, So you see those players get some minutes um, and then you just see some very creative lineups, you know, whatever you have to do to, you know, give Dylan and give Dylan and Yuma and Richie, you know, some rest. Um, I, I would like to think that once we clinch, if we clinch first place, um, that Mark starts doing some, some preparation for next year um, until that first playoff game comes around. I don't think that any of our key players should sit out. I think that, you know, everyone that we would want to have in there gets, you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, just to, you know, to make sure they, they keep their legs under them. But I would hope that we do see a lot of rotation and a lot of different looks if that time comes. Mika, how do you, how do you feel about, I guess, the you know it's kind of a philosophical thing where it's like do we ensure that the players are rested and fit um or do we ensure that like we're kind of tactically clicking and like able to operate at like a high level do you think uh, it's obviously a balance to strike but where where does the needle fall i guess on that range like how much will mark focus on staying in tune versus rotation yeah um, i think mark will rotate more aggressively um and i would be fully in favor of that because there's absolutely no reason to risk some of our you know first choice um players heading into the postseason and we can confirm that matt Boehner is still on the books so (laughs) he probably needs a run out and maybe even Nick Ross comes back soon. He'll probably need some minutes to just get back into it. Um, hopefully anyway, I don't, I don't know where exactly he is on the, on the recovery timeline, but right. um, yeah, I, I don't envy Mark and his staff for having to make these decisions, but at the same time, they're privy to a lot more, you know, uh, bio data of these players than we are as far as, you know, the stress on their muscles and, and on all that. So, and their, their fitness levels. 
So I'm sure they'll be making informed choices about that. But yeah, I, I think the needle falls a little closer to to rotate because there's just I mean, you're not playing for anything anymore in the regular season. So that's where I would that's where I would see it if if and when we win on Saturday. And I think I think we do have I mean, it's just the one season precedent, but I do think we have precedent for kind of believing that because I mean going into the playoffs we played a really rotated side against uh, Los Dos on the last day of the season having clinched um, you know uh, sixth place and avoiding the play-in rounds and all of that stuff Um, and we lost 2-0 and it didn't affect our postseason run you know long term so I think we've seen that Mark does kind of lean more towards you know making sure that people are fit it'll be interesting to see if it is a few games rather than just a single game um, and how he kind of manages that. Um, but I do think that he'll kind of err on the side of caution, especially in a season like this with the, with COVID and, and some of the minutes that, that certain players have gotten, obviously Dylan gets a rest, uh, you know, for most of, of the past game, but still plays a half hour or almost a half hour. Um, so he's played, you know, in basically every single match this season, um, you know, at least off the bench. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I think I think Mark tries to take the opportunity to just give him a little freshness um, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see how it works out. But um, mentioning. Next season, um, and I think, Christian, you brought it up, but. Uh, Jay Kanaki, he asked, looking forward to next season, who do you see leaving the team? Most of the original deals were for two years. Um, so guys, I mean, we are reaching a point where a couple players who were on two year deals will be, you know, free agents at the end of the, at the end of the year in theory. Um, I'm sure negotiations have gone on behind the scenes throughout this, uh, COVID pause that we were on for, for several months because contracts become a little wonky when your season's delayed. Um, but obviously there's, there's moves to be made, but who do you see as kind of having a shorter time left with the locos? Do we see anyone headed for the exits? I, I think that, probably some of the most likely um i i have to think that there's a chance that logan might leave um you know i i hate for that to happen i just think that if if there's a possibility i think that he's had a good two years here um i think that he has that he still has um you know aspirations uh because i he he is relatively young for for a keeper mm-hmm. um you know still 27 i think you know they they play into their their late 30s i i from what i understand um so i think that you know 27 year old keeper is still kind of a prospect um and from you know from the conversation that i had with him at the beginning of the year it doesn't seem like he's the kind of person to be upset having to to sit behind someone who is better than him still. Um, he didn't seem to, to hold any hard feelings, you know, um, about his time with Columbus when he was there, um, you know, <laughs> behind, <laughs> behind Zach Stefan, obviously, yeah. <laughs> um, you behind know, City, so, man city's number two. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that he's the kind of person that still, um, might see that he, he has a lot of time to learn still. Um, on that same note, I think that, Jermaine might go um, maybe not even because he wants to, but because I feel like a backup keeper is kind of like, can we get someone for less money kind of thing? Right. Um, um, so I think if that option comes around and, you know, because of the, the world that we're in right now, it might be easy to find, you know, cheap players, um, you know, players who, who will play for, for peanuts really. Um <laughs> Um, I, I've thought this since the beginning of the year, but recent events have also kind of amplified it, but I think that maybe Chiro might be out the door too. Um, I think he, he might be, I don't know. I, I see. I just feel like he, he was, 
I mean, at the back end of his career, I think he has some years in front of him still, but, you know, he's definitely, um, you know, over the hill, um, as one would say. And then with this kind of injury, who knows, um, you know, who knows if he, if he wants to, to put himself through coming back again and risking hurting his body like that. But those are my three. If I had to pick three that I think would most likely be out the door. Those are my. Yeah. I, I will be sad if it if it turns out that we've already seen Chiro play his last game for Locomotive. That would be extremely dep- That's a very sad thought for me. <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, a couple of interesting points and and Logan's prospects. I think for sure, you know, in terms of players that hit like higher level radars, I'd say Logan is probably one who could potentially make an MLS roster. Um, I just, you know, I'd hate to see him leave and then not play, uh, you know, and just go somewhere just to, to round out the numbers. It would be nice. You know, if, if he gets that shot, I want him to, you know, get a legitimate shot. Um, and I wouldn't begrudge, I wouldn't begrudge any player, um, you know, taking, taking that chance. So I don't know, Mika, Austin, you guys got any, any thoughts on this? So just to kind of go off what Christian was saying with Logan, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think Logan would leave unless he was guaranteed somewhere where he can be the number one keeper there. I don't. I think, yeah, he, I mean, he said, you know, that he didn't mind sitting behind somebody else better than him, but being the number one guy here, I mean, I don't know, just as a player mentality, you wouldn't want to leave somewhere just to back somebody up after you're the number one guy there. Um, I do have one player who I think would – I don't think a lot of people I think would probably leave, but I'm just thinking about what happened in the offseason and at his age um, would be maybe Chapa. Um, but for bigger things, just considering that he was out at LAFC training with them during the offseason, there's definitely no way that he's not on M- other MLS teams' radars um or even maybe other USL squads but he's been having a pretty decent season with the time with the minutes that he's played so his uh, departure especially at his age could be a really good um signee for an MLS squad trying to you know young, get their midfield younger and try to develop them a little bit more yeah i i know in the off season there was like interest in Chapa from other USL sides um trying to sign him so um that it, it's pretty interesting because I think we kind of think of those players as like ours, um, but they are subject to the business of, of the sport as much as anyone else. Um, and just because it's not finders keepers, just because he's from <laughs> El Paso. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't know, Mika, you got any, you got anyone on the list? Yeah, I mean, maybe these are obvious shouts, but just look at the players on the periphery of the squad. I don't think it's necessarily worked out for Moses McKinday here. Um, Matt Boehner. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'll eat my words and we'll see him as soon as we clinch the group. But uh, <laughs> those those players, I don't see. I, I'm. It's hard, though, because, you know, Mark did tell us he's planning for the future as he makes these acquisitions, but you think that you might see at least Matt Vayner once or twice by now, but um, Moses, I think will go uh, Chiro. Yeah. I'll be very sad if it was his last game, but I can see that happening. Um, maybe even Omar Salgado. I mean, some people might be interested in him cause he's got, you know, he has that on his resume of being the, the number one overall pick in MLS. He's playing, you know, pretty well. I think the other USL sides might, might, want to you know try that and from what i understand he's on a pretty substantial wage and uh in covid times we have to think about these things the club does anyway not not us but i mean (laughs) um so i i don't know the financials might play play into this as well um in terms of uh making up the numbers next season so do we start oh sorry go ahead austin i was gonna just kind of piggyback on that on omar with Mark seems to kind of have found him on his right position instead of being a nine playing out on the wing. So that might've made his stock really rise. Mm. Uh, yeah. Christian, Christian, what was your, I was just going to say it's like, when do we start our GoFundMe to keep our, our local players here? 
<laughs> we can give them them fat contracts. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> um, so as uh, we kind of transition, this is a little bit of a teaser uh, of the next, but Patrick Ariola just asks, how banged up and broken down is United? Have they been sufficiently softened up by all these quote unquote home matches that they can wilt during Saturday's game? The short answer Christian. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I, I think that they are a very mentally tough team. Um, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think that this game is going to be any easier than the last five that, that we've played against them. Yeah. Mika, do you think they will? No, no, I don't. They always come for this, this occasion. So yeah, it's going to be another testy one. I think. Awesome. Yeah, I'm on the same page. I think they'll wilt in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> I think, <laughs> they always do. No, I think uh I, I think I think they're eating this shit up, honestly. Like I think this is energizing them in this in narrative this, in this crazy way. Like yeah. I th- I think it I think they feed off of it. Um, I know they play a it up of as sociopaths. <laughs> they like I, I, I think they, I think they really enjoy it. So I, I don't think they will. Um, I do think it will. You know, I think it's tougher, especially now that uh, you know fans are back in the swap and stuff. But, but I do think they feed off of that type of that type of vacation. So um, we'll be back uh, after a real quick break to talk about the Derby del Camino Real and uh, close things out here. Uh, for this episode of Seriously Loco, so stay tuned. Are you tired of the same old uniforms and cookie cutter templates from Nike and Adidas? Um, sometimes things get a little tired, little played out design. There's not that much innovation going on these days, but Icarus FC, I'm here to tell you, they are making some really unique things. I am currently holding in my hands a Babylon Akati FC concept kit that is part of Icarus FC's Mesopotamian Premier League uh, concept league. They created kits for all these teams. They can create similarly unique designs um, for your youth club, Sunday league squad, adult pro team. Icarus FC can help you create the kit of your dreams at an affordable price. Let them help you design your custom kit today at IcarusFC.com. Welcome back to seriously loco and uh guys we've got the small matter of the derby del camino real this weekend but not only that a potential first place clinching game for locomotive at home at the swap 1500 fans allowed allowed um this match in particular there's a certain weight to this one that hasn't even existed in the past because our previous meetings last season, regular season meetings that, you know, had some impact on the standings, but overall didn't matter in the, in the grand scheme. Um, In this one, this match is like winner take all essentially. Uh, And New Mexico has to get a result to stay alive in the hunt for that first place seed and basically avoiding San Antonio. So, I mean, Mika, this is, it's really tough to overstate how important this game is. It's yeah. I mean, it's the first Derby where we're actually playing for something. So it's, I'm trying, I just feel like we have to win or else the narratives just completely shift to a place that we don't want to be um, with New Mexico United having snapped our, our streak and, and, you know, staying alive in the group uh, as far as first place goes. And so, yeah. And I'm just sick of the, the propaganda. (laughs) We need to win and just shut these narratives down before they can, before they can form. All right. Speaking of propaganda, New Mexico United, we know, have had the propaganda machine working at the league, at the club for quite some time, Um, basically since their inception. Um, So 
I'm going to read a tweet. This is an article that was posted this morning by Nicholas Murray. His The Morning Tea. Um, his his uh, daily article about about things in the USL. Did he write this one? This one? Okay, he wrote it. All <laughs> he right. actually he actually did in his defense. Uh, I think he got the message that we are paying attention and defending our local journalist. Shout out to Joe Rodriguez uh, for his piece with Eder Borelli before uh, he scored the game winning goal. Um, he does credit the journalist uh, who got this quote in the first place. But okay, to set the stage, this is a quote from a locomotive player in a Nicholas Murray tweet. Okay. So it starts with a quote and then it goes into his promotion of his article. So quote, I don't think people are giving New Mexico United enough credit for what they're doing. (laughs) Credit hyphen. El Paso Locomotive FC's Drew Becky to Andy Morgan TV. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Stop recording. <laughs> Stop. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Canceled. Are you? <laughs> oh, there's so many beautiful pieces to that. Oh, oh I'm pissed off. Like, what in the actual? <laughs> I wish oh. I wish that we had a video version because the Mika's jaw literally dropped and Austin got out of his chair and walked away. <laughs> so what the fuck, man? <laughs> of all the players, first of all, what? The Second substance of, all, of the quote. What? <laughs> what the fuck? I try not to curse on here because I know people listen with their children in the car and I'm sorry <laughs> but I'm having a bad day <laughs> that's it let me pull up Craigslist oh who needs a center back no. <laughs> free transfer <laughs> this is crazy because Drew always strikes me as like very well like media trained so why would you say something so off base like what? no I'm, I mean it's it's a meme like I just can't I, th- I feel like people just know now I feel he's bought him into the narrative himself. (laughs) Come on, Drew. That's not true. (laughs) This is the New Mexico United League. Like, what do you mean? (laughs) They invented the sport you play. You do not know this. Guys, I don't know how we haven't come up with this yet, but United Soccer Leagues. Oh my God! So most you need Oh my God! Illuminati it's a confirmed. Conspiracy. <laughs> Throw your diamonds in the sky if you feel the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! That's Anyways, so I knew that. I knew that that would that would be uh, that you guys would get a kick out of that. Um, <coughs> so the full the full quote is: whether they're a rival or not, you have to look at their success and how they're doing it. I don't think people are giving them enough credit for what they're doing. For them to have to go on the road every week and be away from their families and risk getting sick in different ways than maybe other teams are, it's very impressive. Now, Mark asked about it. When Mark was asked about it, he said they've got, I think, a lot of mental toughness in their group. I think that's the key thing when you have adversity and you have to be on the road that long. You have to have a lot of mental toughness. They've definitely shown that. I think that's fair. That is fair. Yeah. That is fair. I think saying that they don't get enough credit is <laughs> just wild. <laughs> yes. Uh, agent, they're like, agent they're Drew. like people who are giving them our credit. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's a whole ass pandemic and it's still about them. Mm. <laughs> like, what? It could be a meteor headed towards Earth and they'd still be talking about them. <laughs> And it's like even permeate, permeated like the neutral outlets. It's like that article that Mika shared today. It was written to like it was published today, and it said, "As of the time of writing, New Mexico are five points ahead in their group standings." <laughs> fake news. Like fake news. What? <laughs> Hashtag fake news. <laughs> fake news. <laughs> oh my god! Like, what? I, I expected the the graphic from the league in their game last week saying that they beat us three one. Or three two, whatever yeah. they flip the score. It's I expect, nonstop. I expect that from USL, but this completely neutral 
outside publication comes in with this absolute slander and I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I okay. Can we cancel the league? <laughs> no, we got a shot to to end the narratives, uh, but you would hope you would hope the propaganda machine will roll on, and we know this. Um, Nicholas Murray also had the audacity to pick uh, New Mexico to beat us in the playoff game uh, when we meet because he has. <laughs> When he predicted his playoff bracket, like if the season ended today. Oh, I did see that. He had New Mexico beating San Antonio in the first round and then beating Did us you know? in the second round. So like it's nonstop. Like there is no end to the, it doesn't matter like if teams are better than them, whatever. So speaking of New Mexico United's recent results, uh so they <laughs> do win two nil against Real Monarchs two matches ago, but They go to Colorado, their home match, this weird, like messed up experiment of having a thousand New Mexicans drive to Colorado to watch a soccer game. They lose. And I don't know if I've ever experienced a sweeter version of schadenfreude or enjoying the suffering of others quite as intensely as I enjoyed this loss from <laughs> New Mexico. This was amazing. It was delicious. I'd rather I'd, <laughs> I'd take, I'd take that loss over like a thousand loco victories over them. <laughs> any day of the week. <laughs> Just because of the, the stupid fact that they had to get another team to host them. They travel, they take their, I don't think all thousand win. I thought, I, I think I heard like 850 something. Um, they travel, (laughs) yeah, they travel to Colorado Springs to watch their team get beat by the last place team in the group. Like what? (laughs) I, yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself is the question Mika is, are the cracks starting to show? Like we talk about the mental toughness. Drew Becky talks about how they're underrated, but the are the cracks actually starting to show in this mental toughness and is it starting to wear not to say that they'll wilt in the game against us but has this strain like is it catching up with them a little bit it has to be how can it not i mean that's i mean on one hand It has to be because traveling that much, playing that much on the road, the extra fatigue that comes with all of that, that other teams aren't having to deal with, it has to be wearing on you. But at the same time, New Mexico United love a narrative. And this this challenge, this unique challenge that nobody else is facing, maybe maybe spurring them on. They no. did use it as a rallying cry in the Open Cup as well because they played all of their Open Cup games on the road. For sure. Absolutely. So this is kind of like the dystopian version of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's pandemic enforced. So, you know, two sides to this coin, obviously. Um, results lately been mixed. So I don't know. I mean, like I said, I think they always show up for the occasion of playing us. They like to say that we're not rivals because they've got some like false sense of superiority over El Paso locomotive, but it's, it's just one of those things. Yeah. Form form goes out the window as they say. (laughs) Well, and I think in some ways the loss almost hurts us a little bit in that, you know, they may refocus a little um, being dealt that loss, but the simple fact is that they have one win in four. Two of those games came against uh, switchbacks, a draw and a loss. And then their only win comes against Real Monarchs and they have the loss against us. Um, So this this game in particular, like feels like a great opportunity for Locomotive. The one player, um, it seems like Weehan has gone off the boil a little bit, although he's always pretty good against us. Um, But Amanda Moreno remains a problem and has been very good for them. 
Um, do you think that locomotive use kind of the blueprint of their games um, with other similarly, like, like kind of how they approach San Antonio um, with a player like Pirano? Do you think they try to maybe implement something similar to what we did against San Antonio to, to stop their effectiveness on the counter? We're all deep in thought. <laughs> I'm still just shook. I don't. <laughs> I'm still <laughs> reacting to the propaganda. Um, I I don't think so. On, honestly, I maybe I'm just not observant enough. But like in the San Antonio game, like you saw, at least I saw you know Pirano, and I saw the threat that he could be. And I know Moreno is very good. I'm not denying that, but it doesn't seem like they key their game around him the way a team like San Antonio keys their game around Pirano, um, you know, on his playmaking. So I think for that reason, it might be a little bit different. Maybe I'm saying wrong and maybe he is that focal point of their whole offense, but I, that's not what it looks like to me. That's, I mean, and that's an interesting thought too, because... I think Moreno is a little bit freer in his role than Pirano is. Like, I think Pirano specifically plays in a kind of a certain area of the field and he certainly can play all over, but us, even against us, like he was on the wing, like most of the game, like he kind of stayed out that way. Um, and I don't know if that made it easier for us. Uh, to track him because Moreno has obviously caused us problems uh, and in, in previous games, especially on the counter um, both goals against Monarchs, uh, you know, come in those kind of like transition phases um, that he grabs. So I, I do think that we are going to have to set up similar to similar to the way that we played against San Antonio only because their approach is similar. That's I think they will sit deep and they will try to hit us on the break. Like that is the kind of the common wisdom. Um, and I don't think Lesane's gonna gonna vary from that, even though we did defeat them in the last game. I think he's going to probably try to stick to something like that. Cause if they try to press too high and all this stuff, it is getting late on in the season and they may get beat pretty bad if we if we are able to break those lines and break the press then they could be in trouble so i think we see him sit deep again and and try to hit us on the break yeah i think so too not not only because they want they think they can beat us that way but probably just to conserve energy i mean they don't want to see any major injuries um you know going into going into the postseason um, obviously Armando Moreno has been incredible, but I always, at this fixture to me, I always, always, always focus on Devin Sandoval. Um, I think he's just the symbol of New Mexico United and, um, he's always up for this match, always up for a, a battle penalties, uh, you name it. So he's the one that I'm, I worry about in these fixtures, uh, cause he's, you know, he's a good player. He's a big boy. He's, he's, he's going to be a nightmare for the center backs as he always is. And so, yeah, um, the sheer stats of, of Moreno are, are, you know, <laughs> scary to look at, but it's still Sandoval for me who, who can, who can really hurt us. I think. I, I want to get a sense of who everyone's key player is in this matchup for locomotive Austin. Who are you looking at to have a big game that will give us the edge over, over United in this one? I think it's with their attacking part. I think Logan's really got to have like his game of his like career. There's with so much at stake. Do we really want, <clears throat> do we really want to take the chance of us not clinching it this weekend type of deal? Um, but I think he's really got to have his like game of his, of the year this, this week. Yeah, I think, I think we've seen in the past, uh, you know, even earlier this season, there there was that Sandoval goal that was like kind of he just took it early and kind of catches Logan off his line a little bit. Um, and 
Yeah, I I think no soft goals has got to be the message because I feel that we haven't conceded like a quality goal to United. I think we spoke about this even last episode. Christian, I think you brought it up. Like the fact that we don't give up a lot of like good goals. We give up a lot of goals where we're like, why didn't we stop that? <laughs> so I, I think like the no soft goals shout is, is really good. And Logan certainly will play a key part in this. Uh, Christian, who, who are you looking at from locomotive to make a difference? So for me, I think the key in this game is going to be creating chances for us. Um, I think that we need to have, you know, 25 shots this game. Um, and, and make Lubin make Lubin work. And so because of that, I think that Dylan has to have a really good game. He, he had a really good game um, in our win against them um, a couple weeks ago. And I think that that needs to happen again. I, I just don't think that, um, I don't think that we're a, th- a huge threat if, um, if Dylan doesn't have a good game. And, and New Mexico is going to score. I, I am not expecting a clean sheet in this one. Um, so we have to score more. Um, and I think that Dylan having a really good game is key to that. <clears throat> and, uh, Freudian slip on the keeper. Mizell, uh, yeah. Mizell oh, shit, has sorry. Your, uh, Lubin Mizell. Wrong, <laughs> wrong shit house keeper. So. I, uh, I hate them both, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I could see exactly how your brain was working. It was fine. Um, so the, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I'd, I'd certainly agree. Dylan's going to play a key role in this, and and uh, it'll be fascinating to to see him back out there, especially given the fact that he was able to be rested for a little bit, and hopefully he can deliver a couple of nice, uh, you know, set piece set piece deliveries in there as well. Um, Mika, who are you? Who are you focused on? I'm focused on who I think is our Devin Sandoval, which is Omar Salgado. Um, I think that his physicality and his pace are going to be a big, uh, key against the tired team in New Mexico United. Um, and so I think that we should really exploit that. And I, and I'm not impressed by, you know, their defense outside of Kalen Ryden. So, um, you know, not that they're not good players, but I just, I think they can be got at, um, so especially if, if Omar's going to go one-on-one uh, with, with any of those fullbacks. So, so yeah, Omar, for me, I think if, if he plays, I think he'll be, he'll be very important for us in, as far as driving our play forward and, and uh, you know, trying to, to get behind the lines and, and, and put something away. I think, I think to that, that is, yeah, absolutely going to be vital. And I think at the beginning of the last match, we were commenting in the opening stages about how frequently Omar was getting in behind their fullback and they were kind of seeding that space to him and we weren't able to exploit it in any like useful way, at least early in the match. Um, obviously like things turned around. Um, but yeah, I would, I'd, I'd like to see us, you know, make them pay (laughs) for, for giving Omar any sort of space. Um, And then I think from my perspective, I'm thinking mainly about the midfield to keep United from being as dangerous on the counter. We need to be like very careful and very like uh, we need to be good stewards of the ball. Like we we need to Mm -hmm. not give it away in positions that put our back line immediately under pressure um, because United love that they absolutely thrive off of it. So um, I'm looking at, you know, I think we know kind of what we can expect from Richie and Yuma and it like in these type of games, but the type of player that I'm looking at is like, if Choppa is going to get a start, then he needs to be like absolutely on for however long he's on the pitch, like, you know, hopefully he can play a full 90, but, um, but I think in that number eight position that we, that we normally employ in front of our deepest lying midfielder, they are going to be tasked with a lot of defensive work, a lot of um, like covering a lot of space, 
obviously driving the play from defense into attack when we're in possession. So there's going to be a lot expected of them and we need, they need to be switched on the entire game. So I think, I think if we have a good game, it'll be because we're controlling things in the midfield effectively and, and taking care of the ball um, and not giving away, not giving it away in those like dangerous uh, areas, not just in our own half, but like, in their half, you know, if we, if we make a bad pass and it's cut out by a forward or a midfielder who can play a, a progressive pass for them, then it could be a real issue for us. So yeah, I I think Chapa is the one that comes to mind because he's been more regularly started than anyone else in the absence of Nick Ross. So, um, he's who I'm, who I'm keying on for this one, but you can see based on the variety of responses that it is like there is a, a very shared responsibility from front to back uh, in this locomotive team to get a result. And it'll be a tough ask to get a sixth win in a row. I mean, for any team to win six on the bounce, as they say, um, is like a very, very tough ask. Um, but. Now the question comes, do we think Locomotive can get the win? What will be the score and who will be the goal scorer? It's the score prediction. And Christian, I mean, you're the organizer. You're, you are also unfortunately bottom of the table, but what is, what is your thought about the order of picking? Because uh, going first has not, proven to be an advantage in any palpable way. Um, so do you want to alter? I, I will give you the, the option to discuss, you know, the, the order of selection. You know, I don't think we change it this year. I think we, we stay consistent. Um, you know, when, when it comes around to next season, we, we can uh, discuss it at that <laughs> point, but I think that, I think that consistency in a league is important. So. All right. Well, you're up first then. So I don't stone me. I'm picking solely for this pick is not where my heart is. It's solely <laughs> for, for the sake of trying to, to win this thing or at least not come in last. So I'm going to go with a one, one draw okay. um, is my pick here. I think it, um, I'm going for a one, one draw with a Maris goal. And like I said, I don't think anyone else is going to pick a draw. So I'm doing that to hopefully get the unique result and (laughs) gain some ground. Yeah. Don't anyone else pick a draw now? Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. Um, yeah, I, so I guess I'm next. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I'm going, I'm going optimistic from a locomotive perspective, but there's reasoning behind it. And the chance creation in, in these last few matches has been very high, but our goals have been low compared to, you know, compared to what we created. So I feel like we might, you know, re- progress to the mean, if you will, like we might, actually start performing closer to our uh, expected goals or, you know, the amount of chances we create. So I'm going to go for a three, one locomotive win. Very optimistic. I know, but I'm going to go for it. Locomotive clinch. And, uh, and I will say that (laughs) because I keep, no, actually I'm going to change it up because I think I've been jinxing Gomez for weeks now. (laughs) Um, And so he'll probably score this weekend now that I say this, but I will go for an Omar uh, Salgado goal. Um, He'll uh, body somebody and then just put his laces through it like he did a couple weeks ago. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping for. Me, right? right? Yeah. Mika's a, all right, because I was giving him a lot of shit. I'm going to go stupid, stupid with this one. <laughs> I'm going 3-1 as well. And I say that Drew Becky just like 
fumbles one over the line. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> like stick it in the mixer, just shit house it over the line and he scores and all What if it's like in. a Chicharito first goal at Man U type thing just right off the face? <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. All will be forgiven if he does that. So that's I mean that's me. you you I think you're um kind of trying to do some some psychology here because you picked Rebellion out of the lineup last week. So I think that you're <laughs> but you're subtly hoping oh, that, no. that we don't see Drew this the week. Conspiracy <laughs> thickens. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I actually think we might see him, but we'll see. And Austin. All right. So, Ostradamus. <laughs> let us know. Tell us what's going to happen. So I want to be completely transparent here. This pick I already had in my head. But because Phil, he saw it so in a dream. It. No, Phil <laughs> literally took my pick. Oh, shit. Score and goal mm-hmm. scorer. What? Bruh. But I'm still going to stick with it. So we we're about to win this score. shit. <laughs> I just, I, my same mentality came from Phil's. Like, same thing happened last season before we thrumped Portland, like, four to nothing. Where just games leading up to it, we had so many chances and just not putting them away. And I feel like our defense is just getting better and better. And I really think we're going to put that thumping on New Mexico like they did to us last year up in Albuquerque. So Phil literally took my prediction, but I'm going to stick with <laughs> my it. My bad. But my spoon as well. It's the perks. It's I'm the in- perks of getting to go first. I'm inspired. <laughs> Ostradamus is, is aligning, which means, I mean, win inbound. So you guys hear, yeah. heard it here first. Like, this is happening. So I'm telling you though, when Becky scores, <laughs> Mika Militia rise up. <laughs> Mika Militia take to the streets. Uh, no. <laughs> oh my God. Well, it is going to be a fascinating matchup on Saturday and I know we're all excited. Looking forward to it. It'll be, it'll be great to obviously hopefully extend this win streak and one more win will put locomotive into first place and getting that, that home field for the first round uh, will be such such a W for them, um, but hopefully they can get the W this weekend to get it. And uh, if you guys have enjoyed this episode, you can find Seriously Loco on all the major podcast platforms, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and uh, basically wherever you find podcasts. You can also find us on social media on our Twitter uh, at uh, Seriously Loco. And... Uh, Gosh, it's Darby. It's Darby. Time for a Darby once again. It seems like it's happened a bunch because it has. Um, but we've got. Uh, we'll have all the all the all the fallout of that result uh, whenever it does come. And ha- however USL decides to spin locomo- or locomotives win over United <laughs> into a United positive, uh, we will be here to to smash the narrative. But uh, until that time, stay loco.